All right, everyone, thank you for joining us here for Real Talk Office Hours. That's a hunting for silver linings for this Monday, June 15th, 2020. Today, it is Corey Hart and George Gutsanos. And on Wednesday, we're going to be expecting a special guest from Startup Grind Ghana. That's on the 17th in just a couple of days. We are brought to you by Startup Grind, the world's largest startup community. We have 600 plus chapters in over 125 countries. And Startup Grind operates with a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. We're also driven by three key values. That's make friends, not contacts, help others before you help yourself and give before you take. Now this pandemic has been and will continue to be for some time, the great global leveler. As entrepreneurs, we do our very best for our businesses, teams, and families, and we should be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. We should also learn to control our biases as they emerge in various circumstances. We invite you to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as we record these episodes. And as we track the intersection of facts, biases, and action through the review of global financial markets alongside check-ins and real talk with Startup Grind chapter directors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem stakeholders from across the world. We do this because no one has a crystal ball, but if we keep our eyes and ears open and pay attention, we may be able to see around the bend and with some luck spot the silver linings that are around every cloud. If you miss the live events, you can catch the recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids. And then you can also download the reading notes from our show. Now, before I introduce George for the Global Market Update, a little bit of housekeeping. Comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to invite or incite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform, not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade and or invest, please call your broker. And remember, however, risk is everywhere, even when you think that you're not taking a risk. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to everyone, George Katsanas, to get us started with our global market update. Thank you, Corey. Hello to everyone in our ecosystem, in our community. As uh, we have always uh, mentioned uh, to our participants, we are entrepreneurs and we're investors. As both, we have to understand the world around us. We have to keep track of the changes that are taking place in financial markets and uh, with that we start with this bloodbath as the market has been rebounding from the lows of 18,000 and change in the Dow Jones all the way to nearly 28 29,000 we have always cautioned our investors today is a bloodbath global markets are precipitously falling and we're not done yet. We have seen that mom and pop investors who have opened up accounts since March of this year in every trading platform have done quote unquote well. Goldman Sachs is pointing out that choices, selections of equities by investors, retail investors have essentially superseded the performance expected by Wall Street experts. This is not unusual. However, look at Hertz. Hertz filed for bankruptcy. Investors rewarded the company with a tremendous amount of goodwill. The stock went um, after a series of um, Actions um, went up and up and up. Um, the stock has surged uh, uh, more than people expected, more than analysts expected. And yet today the stock was down 25% when we had regular trading, when regular trading started. What does this tell us? There is a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out fear of essentially underestimating the power of the federal reserve and uh, investors uh, hoped that things were going to return to some kind of normal the currencies are telling us a story of what we would call benign neglect the dollar is trading under 113 when you look at the detail of the dollar euro exchange rate you can see that we traded um, 
as high as um, one fourteen almost, and not so long ago. Uh, we go back to one twelve seventy. The dollar has strengthened a little bit. However, this is temporary. We have seen that most of world currencies have essentially performed in line with expectations, meaning that as the US economy was stabilizing, as more money was put into supporting the economic system across the world, investors started moving away from quote unquote safe assets, quote unquote safe havens like the dollar, dollar assets to other assets. The yen has strengthened back to below 108. We're now at 107.33. That means the Japanese banks are bringing yen back into Japan. That means they're selling assets and they're reverting their holdings back into yen. That is also another safe haven consideration. We see that the um, dollar Swiss franc is at under one is at 0 0.9495. The um, Swiss investors are reticent. They don't want to abandon the safe haven. They're very cautious. When we look at the fixed income market, the fixed income market is telling us a similar story. And remember, we admonished all our investors and all our entrepreneurs to pay attention to the fixed income market. The fixed income market is the barometer of what investors are thinking. Japan, 0%. Australia, 0 0.85. New Zealand, 0 0.7. Hong Kong, 0 0.3. Singapore, 0 0.9. South Korea, 1.4. India, safely under 6%. Compared to Friday's close, what has changed? Well, reality is creeping in. The bond investors are telling us that in a deflationary environment, growth is going to be anemic at best. Therefore, if you want to maintain, to preserve your capital, you will probably have to invest in safe assets, in safer assets, and that is government bonds. Look at Europe. For the first time in its recent history, the 10-year bond in Greece is trading close to 1%. This is the most phenomenal rally that we've seen over the last two months in the fixed income market. It is extraordinary. Italy, 1.4%. These two countries were supposed to be the weakest in the European economic system. They're outperforming. Germany, back, close again, back to minus 0.5%. Switzerland, almost unmoved to 0.5% negative. What the European fixed income market is telling us, growth is nowhere to be seen. Therefore, investors are piling in into any asset that has a plus sign in front of it. On the fixed income side. You, when we look at the Americas, we only look at the US, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico as indication of what is happening. Well, believe it or not, the 10 year bond in the US has a 0.6 handle in front of it. Not 1%, not 1.3%, not 0.9%, as we saw last week. The rally has been significant. Why? Investors are concerned. Brazil, 6.8%. Mexico, under 6%. Canada, 0.5%. Fixed income investors prefer the sanctuary of government bonds than equities. And by the way, let's have a look at our commodities pictures. West Texas, $35. After flirting with $40 a barrel, West Texas is slowing down again. Why? A lot of supply, slow demand. Oil traders will tell us that the supply and demand imbalance persists. Brent, 
$38. Natural gas, under $1.7 under $1.7 per thousand BTUs. Let's look at gold. Gold is retrenching, 1718. From the highs of 1730, 35, 1740 last week, we're now close to 1700. We have had range trading in gold for quite some time. Investors in gold have two major fears. One, inflation. Second, safe haven in the basement of currencies. This is why gold remains relatively stable in this range of 1650, 1750. Copper, however, has been rallying. From a high of 261, 262, we're now trading 258. Well, let's see what copper tells us. Over the next few days and weeks, we'll be watching at copper because we want to understand what is happening in the manufacturing sector around the globe. And copper is the best indicator for manufacturing growth. On the agricultural front, we know that the weather has been wonderfully supportive of large crops in corn, wheat, soybeans. The market has been essentially exuberant. Last week's WASDE report about the size of the crop supports large size crops. And we have said that before. Unless China starts buying more of corn, wheat, soybeans from the US, the prices will remain soft. The same thing with other commodities. And remember also the point that Goldman Sachs made last week in the research. They thought that commodities prices had rallied ahead of themselves. It is quite likely that this exuberance that we have seen so far is going to be tempered. Look at the equities around the globe. After a few weeks of green, green, green across the board, today we have a bloodbath. Asia is closing or has closed in negative numbers. Pakistan down 6%. The Hang Seng down 2%. Nikkei down 3.5%. Uh, Europe is following suit, with the exception of um, Italy, which is just treading water, uh, the um, Milan, Switzerland, which is 0.4% up. The rest of Europe is down, and it will continue to go down. We have three major issues. One, household engagement. Two, corporate engagement. Three, healthcare. Let me clarify. The markets are discounting the future. The markets are a mechanism of using the latest available information to anticipate future events that are relevant for the valuation of assets. Where well, these assets are commodities, equities, bonds, or currencies, the markets are an information discounting mechanism. What the markets are telling us is that, for instance, in the US, we've had at least $7 trillion worth of support, both monetary and fiscal, from the Federal Reserve and Congress. In a $20 trillion economy, $7 trillion worth of support is a big number. This support is beginning to subside. This is why the Federal Reserve has become a marketing organization. Having nationalized the markets, the Federal Reserve is now touting its ability and willingness to keep on printing money. As Bill Dudley, the former governor of the New York Federal Reserve, mentioned in a post two weeks ago, we have serious moral hazard issues. One, who is going to pick winners? When we're supporting companies, zombie companies, who is going to make this determination and why? 
Second, when we're supporting zombie municipalities, zombie states, who is going to make this decision? Why? For how long? Three, by bailing out companies, institutions that are essentially defunct, who are postponing not only the time of crisis for these institutions, but we are challenging future generations. We are taking money from the future, growth from the future to support the present. In real talk, we have never argued for abandoning Keynesian policies at a time of crisis. In real talk, we have never been political in the sense that we understand the logic of markets. We have always believed the nature of markets in the sense that markets discount news. Some of the reactions of the markets are meaningful. Some of the reactions are trivial. We know what is driving the markets is fear and greed. We have admonished all our listeners, all our entrepreneurs, all our investors to be cautious. As the second wave of the pandemic is touching us, our relatives, our friends, our acquaintances, not only here in the US, around the globe, we're becoming more and more aware of how fragile our ecosystem is. And this is why our effort in real talk is to expand, extend a hand of welcoming of all our teams, all our participants around the globe to share views. We want to go beyond this fear of deglobalization. We should keep in touch and we should be positive because things are likely to get difficult. So hold on to your lederhosen, put on your parachute, and be prepared for more volatility. Back to you, Corey. Thank you, George. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, fr between Friday and today, um, a lot of things to be paying attention to. Now, you mentioned some things that I'd really like to ask you a little bit more about, uh, especially when it gets to um, the reactions in the markets that are meaningful. And you brought up the, the term zombies, and that's something that we're seeing more and more and more in the press. Uh, could you quickly explain, like, what is a zombie? Um, and why, why is it important to really be paying attention when central banks across the planet are just propping up entire economies? Thank you, Corey. Um, zombie company is a company that has negative cash flow has lost its competitive advantage and is likely to default. Look at Hertz. Hertz outlived its model. In a world where the whole concept of car rental is changing, where our concept of mobility is changing, Hertz lost its mojo. Look at a company like Nordstrom, or uh, for this matter, any of the clothing companies that had closed in the recent past. These companies were relying on a supply chain of products manufactured very cheaply around the globe, imported into the US, paying very little import tariffs, and selling it three times, four times, five times above the cost price. So essentially, zombie companies are companies that have no sustainable competitive advantage. In them. You could argue that some of the automotive manufacturers, the American automotive manufacturers, the French automotive manufacturers, the European automotive manufacturers are zombie companies. We have excessive capacity, production capacity in the automotive industry. Why are we bailing them out? You could argue that the air travel industry, the large commodity air travel industry is outdated. Some of these companies shouldn't exist. Why are we bailing them out? The real problem is that we're using taxpayer money from the future 
to pay for crimes and misdemeanors of today. When the Federal Reserve is buying bonds, government bonds, corporate bonds, municipal bonds in the open market to keep interest rate low, the, essentially the Federal Reserve is subsidizing the Treasury and all these bond issuers with cheap money. That amount that we have issued so far at the moment is not creating inflationary pressures. However, in the future, we have to find a way to stop printing money, to take a hit. Yes, the role of the Federal Reserve is price stability and low unemployment. In an environment, however, like this, where both of these targets are becoming politicized, they're becoming political instruments, the market is taking a step back. And to be absolutely clear, the global monetization of debt may not be a problem today, may not be a problem a year from today, may not be a problem two years from today as the Federal Reserve indicated last week because of ZERP, zero interest rate policy. But at some point, it will come back to haunt us. We're becoming addicted to low interest rates, to artificially low interest rates. Therefore, we should be expecting bubbles. We should become expecting asset prices to inflate beyond normal. That's why we should all be careful. That's why as investors, as entrepreneurs, as decision makers about our families, our businesses, our communities, we have to be extremely careful. The environment is murky. There's a lot of obfuscation around. And I caution, as I mentioned before, all our listeners, be frugal. Be frugal in your decisions. Look into your cash flow 13 weeks from today. Be disciplined about your cash flow. What you're earning today may not be there next quarter. Make serious decisions about your business viability. We have a lot of issues that we need to resolve ahead of us. Back to you, Corey. Thanks for that, George. Now, I, I have another question for you. Um, as, as we're now um, reeling from uh, you know, the market's paying attention to, okay, maybe there's the second wave is upon us or here it comes or whatever. Um, we also have some big folks out there like Morgan Stanley maintaining that they are calling for a V-shaped recovery. Um, like how can, how can these reputable long-standing firms from around the globe like disagree on on V versus U when you know we're all looking at the same data. Corey, um, remember that um, different kinds of organizations have different objectives. Can you imagine a day when the chairman of the Federal Reserve will come on the microphone and say, please sell everything. We're heading into the worst recession of our lifetime. Or Secretary of the Treasury saying that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the road. It's going to become seriously bad. They cannot say that. They will never say that. We are in, a, in an election year, right? So what all these individuals, all these analysts in Wall Street are actually doing, they're looking at the past, trying to draw lessons about the future. They're trying to discount the future based on what we know from the past. Well, as Nassim Taleb mentioned in his book about black swans, this ain't necessarily the truth. This is not necessarily the right approach. Take it with a pinch of salt. And, uh, and then we also have news of... Uh like Germany and France, uh, further opening borders uh, today and all that other all that fun stuff. We got uh, Boris Johnson uh, still trying to negotiate uh, the, the trade 
uh, with the EU. These are all things that are happening all at the same time as we're watching, you know, some some people taking stock of uh, some reality of what's of, of what's really happening, right? Well, um, again, um, look at BP. BP took a eighteen billion dollar write up. Write up. They wrote off eighteen billion dollars worth of assets. This is because of essentially the spat within OPEC. We've enjoyed a Goldilocks kind of economy for far too long. People don't even remember that in the 2008 crisis, we had TARP, we had $850 billion, we had Warren Buffett putting money, lending money to Goldman Sachs, Warren Buffett lending money to all kinds of institutions. And um, the bubble that was created was anchored on low interest rates globally. So, um, Political decisions are the outcome of economic realities. I don't think Europe is essentially functioning yet. It will take more crises like the ones we've had here in the US over the last 200 years. Economic crisis, political crisis, cash flow crisis for Europe to actually consolidate its existence. On the other hand, we have to look beyond Europe. We have to look at Asia. We have to look at Africa, Latin America. The world economy is far from healthy. Until we have a vaccine, we will not have a stable path to household engagement in the economy and to corporate engagement in the economy. Over the next few weeks, we will be listening again from CEOs about earnings. At the end of June, we have the end of the second quarter. Sometime in late June, early July, we'll start hearing from executives in large American and European and Asian companies, essentially the global economy. We'll be listening to their statements. We'll be reading what they expect for the near term. One of the areas that people are not looking at is education. People are not looking at healthcare. This crisis has actually accelerated the evolution of healthcare provision and the evolution of education. Expect a lot of zombie universities. We should see consolidation in higher education. We, we should see better education at high school levels, at primary school levels. We should be retraining our teachers. Academia is going to change very, very substantially over the next couple of years. Now, related to that, um, uh, maybe some doubling down on uh, infrastructure as is it, is it uh, relates to data and like internet service. Oh, absolutely. Uh, to, to accommodate such things, right? Well, uh, 100%. In, and you're touching an issue that we have discussed before, namely cybersecurity. The whole cybersecurity issue is going to be the Achilles heel of education. Universities, especially smaller colleges, regional universities, have not invested in protecting their assets, their cyber assets. They have not invested in protecting the students. I'm not surprised that <clears throat> you will see huge changes in online education, remote delivery, in the protection of data. Uh, Palantir is thinking of going public sometime in the fall. One of the most secretive, highest quality cybersecurity companies in the US and arguably in the globe. The spat with Huawei is not only about infrastructure, it's about data. It's about who owns and monetizes the data. So um, you are 100% correct. Well, so now we have, uh, we have the news from Friday, we have the news from today, um, same, same. And as we uh, are looking at, at moving through the, the rest of this week, um, on Wednesday, we're going to have a special guest from uh, Ghana, Startup Grind. Um, George, do you have any uh, 
any uh any last comments for for our uh for our network of followers as we always uh, mention Corey, um we live in the great lakes area we are fortunate to be close to the largest concentration of fresh water on the planet that means we have a responsibility and we have a challenge our responsibility is to maintain this area and our challenge is to make our knowledge available in startup grind we share knowledge we would like to extend our embassy to everyone who wants to listen and who needs help we have turned around companies we have coached executives we have trained individuals in decision making we should always welcome questions and we do welcome questions our audience should always feel free to contact us thank you Yes, and, uh, and they can do that. It's uh, Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, at startupgrind.com. And then our chapter is Grand Rapids. So that's uh, startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids. Um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we do these check-ins with uh, Startup Grind chapter directors from around the world. We have got quite a good library of them already. Uh, really powerful conversation uh, last week um, in, uh, in Gaza. And then upcoming this week, we have Jordan. Uh, we've spoken with people um, on both sides of the African continent, as well as in the U.S. and Europe, uh, namely uh, Italy. So we've already been around the globe once, and we're going to do it again. So until then, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>